All right, well, let's get going. Um, I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse. And today with me, I have my colleague, Liz Cates, who joins me every now and then when she's been working on a research project and has something insightful to share. So this week, she's gonna to talk to us about decision fatigue. And I think this is something that academic leaders can really relate to, Liz. So thank you so much for coming in this week. Um, as always, use the chat to connect and share resources. And then please, if you have a question, pop it in the Q&A because I know we've got some time for questions. So Liz, if you'll go to the next slide, this is also new for me. I don't get to drive this time. So <laughs> I cannot recommend Liz's blog post today enough. It's, um, is decision fatigue wearing you out? Three strategies for overcoming it. And if you're like me, you'll read it and you go, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep, uh-huh, okay. And next week's webinar, I wanna invite you to join us. We're gonna have Karine Dadini, our Assistant Head of School for Teaching and Learning, talk about Teach About Me. And she's really gonna dive into some of the work that she's been doing with the academic side of the house for quite some time on identity courses and the, the power of um, teaching students about me. All right, next slide. All right, well, Liz, since you're here, I'm gonna turn this into a question instead of just a statement, but you're working with schools every day, I know right now, as they are figuring out how they're going to be leveraging online learning this year for their students and helping them with unexpected questions or maybe things that they knew would pop up but they didn't know exactly how. So any advice, any wisdom to offer here? Um, so we are hearing from schools um, who have last minute staffing changes. Unfortunately, um, in, uh, schools are not immune from the uh, the big quit or the great resignation that's uh, happening nationally. So we are hearing about many more late breaking staffing changes and departures than usual. Um, and if that happens, um, we would encourage you to give us a call to see if our online courses can help. Um, we work with schools to make sure that we have a strong, solid onboarding process for uh, students and families so that families understand the difference between taking a course that's been designed by specialists in online learning um, for the online or learning experience as opposed to crisis distance learning, which is what so many schools were doing last year. Um, and uh, we have over 100 courses in our course catalog, so chances are we can help you out. So please don't hesitate to pick up the phone and give our office a call. So and I really think this moves really nicely into this week's Pulse topic, which is decision making, right? So when you are at capacity for making decisions, this is one way one schoolhouse can help, right? You can, we can take care of something for you. So we asked the question this week, what's your decision-making capacity right now? And you wrote about this, Liz, and what did we find out? Uh, we're pretty full. Um, that um, about half of the people said, you know what, um, I, I'm feeling okay. Like I'm feeling like I'm in the right spot. And, um, and then another 50% said, I am at or over capacity. I should not be making any, I, I don't want, I don't feel like I have the ability to make good decisions anymore. Um, and so I think what that tells us is we certainly expect the start of school to be a time full of decision making for academic leaders. Um, but this year, uh, people are feeling like the decisions that they're making are higher stakes and they're making more of them than ever. So great point. And um... Unfortunately, our surveys are anonymous, so we can't outsource to that 14% of people who've got some more capacity, because that's what I thought when I looked at that, I was like, can I call them <laughs> yep. and get some decisions? Can I outsource some decisions here? Yeah. So, yeah, great. So, you know, you wrote this week about decision fatigue. You really had a nerve. It's something that's coming up. So just to, what made you pick this topic? Like, how did you get into this? So, um, I mean, I hop over in my next slide, but I'll talk about this in a second. So um, what we decided that we, in, in August, we wanted to focus on decision-making and problem solving, just sort of honoring the fact that academic leaders spend much of this month dealing with whatever comes over the tramps or the threshold. You know, it's in front of you, 
you solve it, you move on to the next thing. Um, at one schoolhouse, we call August whack-a-mole month um, because they just sort of keep popping up and you smack them down and another one pops up and that's just the way it goes. It's what we expect to have happen. Um, it's not a crisis that you have a lot of decisions in August, um, but it is important to note that making decisions um, is not just a factor of your ability to, um, to have, to, to look at what your options are and to weigh among them. Um, and that goes to, to sort of the, the big thing that I want people to take away, which is there is no such thing as a good or bad decision maker. And that's because the ability to make decisions is so complex and it's an outcome of many things that have nothing to do with what the actual decision or options are. They have to do with our physical, uh, our physical bodies and our cognitive profiles and our social identities. All these things are key factors in how we make decisions, no matter what decision is in front of us. Interesting, so you really dove into this research. I. I totally geeked out on this, Sarah. Um, <laughs> this was, I love it, was it. One, it was one of those things where you read a little bit and something really resonates with you and you just dive in because um, I'm, I'm a big believer that in understanding, um, I believe this as an educator and as an administrator um, and as somebody who works with schools, that the more you understand about how you think um, the more you're going to understand about why you think and what you think. Yeah, and, and help others grow. Absolutely. Right. So what'd you learn? Um, so there Besides are th that we're not good or bad decision makers. Right. So there are three main things that I th were takeaways from my research. And the first is that the human capacity to make decisions is finite. So let me clarify this. I don't mean over the course of your life, if you use up your decision-making by age 35, you're never gonna be able to make a decision again. What I mean is that typically in any given day, you can't just keep making decisions. And that's because the capacity to make decisions sort of fills up. So if you think about this, um, that this big white balloon here is your capacity and that over the course of the day, you make decisions and some of them are little. Some of them are, am I gonna hit the snooze button? Uh, do I want to make coffee at home or do I really feel like I wanna get a latte on the way to work? Um, or, um, or which way do I go? Is there gonna be a, like, do I think there's a traffic jam here? All of those are decisions that pop in. We make hundreds, thousands of decisions a day. And over the course of the day, those decisions slowly build up. And we, and we sort of fill up that finite capacity. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that my ring light just went out. So I'm gonna look a little more zombie than usual today. Okay, so the second thing to know is that as you approach your capacity, your ability to make good decisions falters. So Interesting. if we're here, those decisions in the bottom row of these little marbles or gumballs, you made those pretty easy and, and they were pretty good. And then as you went through the day, slowly you're, you became, it became harder to weigh your options, to put long-term gain and short-term gain in perspective. And eventually you hit the place where you're just full up. And at that point, you're gonna avoid decisions, you're gonna be overwhelmed, and you're gonna look, you're gonna overvalue what's in front of you. Um, so Sarah, you and I were joking, essentially we get our teenage brains back at the end of the day when you're just like, <laughs> like yes, now, please. Um, and eventually you just sort of spill over, you get full. Yeah, you drop some. So this is why the meltdown when somebody says what's for dinner. Oh yeah. Right. End of right. the day. And it's like, I don't care. <laughs> I just can't do it anymore. Right. We've um every grown up has done that. They've opened the fridge and they've been like, no, done. Um, yeah, and then for me, it's microwave popcorn. For some people, it's DoorDash. For other people, it's mac and cheese. Um, but we all get to that place sometimes. Yeah, and that leads um, me. I might have opened a can of green beans and made box mac and cheese recently. <laughs> Happens. got everything right so, sometimes it's good 
Um, so that leads me to, the, to, to, to sort of that picture. That point where you're running out of capacity and space, that's decision fatigue. Okay. Um, interestingly, so decision fatigue is related to a lot of other cognitive processes, including willpower and self-control. Um, and um, some uh, psychologists actually call it ego depletion like your sense of yourself and your sense of the world just sort of gets used up. Wow, that's so, huge. Right? right, and so that leads me to the third point that I wanna make, which is that understanding what causes decision fatigue helps you manage your decision load. I like because, your graphics, thank you. <laughs> it was fun, um, but because so much of decision-making is not related to the decision in front of you or the choices that you have. Understanding all those pieces can help you do it more effectively and efficiently. All right, so we can avoid having that teenage brain meltdown. Yes. Kind of situation. So what are the elements that we need to understand? And you, in your blog, you talked about some pretty specific pieces of information. And I think those should be in here. I think academic leaders need to know those. Yeah. Um, like you talked about glucose. Yes. So the first thing is that glucose can mitigate or even reverse decision fatigue. So this is fat. There's this study um, <laughs> that really came out of um, milkshakes. So when the idea of decision fatigue emerged out of um, uh, psychological studies about self-control. And originally the idea for self that, that people would be able to, was the people be able to strengthen their self-control um, that they lose self-control because they're searching, they're, they're searching for pleasure. And therefore, if you get, if you get your pleasure needs satiated, then you should be able to handle, um, to, 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 to then have more self-control or more willpower. So to test this, scientists had two groups. One group, they gave like a yummy rainbow sprinkle milkshake. I bet it wasn't rainbow, um, but they gave a yummy like ice cream milkshake. And the other group, um, they gave basically sludge. Um, it was the texture of a milkshake. It had the nutritional, comp basically composition of a milkshake but it didn't taste good. So the thinking was, and then they were asked after they had drunk this milkshake or this sludge to then do um, a task that required self-control. So the hypothesis was the folks that got the yummy milkshake would have more self-control than the group that drank the sludge. But that's not what happened. What happened was that both groups had equal amount of self-control. Um, and it's important to note that they had, before this, they had um, basically depleted um, people's self-control. Like one of the ways that you do that, I love this, is that you show them something funny and you tell them not to laugh. Um, that is actually a way of depleting your self-control. So, um, so this but, is like the marshmallow test on steroids. It kind of is. So, yeah, okay. so the group that drank the sludge and the group that drank the milkshake had the same response. They both had increased self-control. So hmm. the question was, why did that happen? Clearly it wasn't pleasure, like the sludge milkshake wasn't fun or yummy to drink. And what they started to realize was that it was the fact that they had replenished energy because nutritionally, the two drinks were the same. And since then, yeah. Further study, that was sort of like the first study on this. And since then further studies have been done showing that eating a little bit in glucose, if you're a sugar person, it can be sugar, um, but really it's any glucose is just what your body converts. It's the, it's the way that your body converts food to energy. Um, so you could have kale snacks in your desk. You could have kale saying. snacks in your desk if you are a kale person. Um, you could have gumdrops if you're a gumdrop person, but just eating a little bit actually completely refuels your brain. So if you've ever been in that like after school faculty meeting where it feels like people are just going and nobody can make a decision, that's because they can't, they're depleted. So make sure that your body is ready to make decisions when you have decisions to make. Um, and 
And, you know, honestly, like have a snack basket, have food but after the end of the school day before your faculty meeting. Make sure people are fueled so that they're ready to do the work you're asking them to do. And so is there anything in the research about, you know, kind of what size snack or how much if it's four o'clock? I didn't know, do that. I didn't do that dive. My guess <laughs> is that there is, um, and um, but it's pretty. The, the 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 research is conclusive about the need for that that getting your body more fuel, more energy, can in fact reset or 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 increase your capacity. Essentially, it expands it. Yeah, and something you told me. And I hope I'm not getting ahead of us to tell me to, to back down, but you talked a little bit about knowing your own responses and understanding where you are on the spectrum of decision fatigue at a point in time and knowing what to do about it. Like that kind of self-awareness being important. Yep. Um, so that's actually my next slide. And oh, that well, there is, you go. Nice, nice job. Um, so that is the fact that when you make a decision affects how well you make the decision. Um, so there's another study and a lot of the studies that I'm talking about today are come from a New York Times article um, about decision fatigue that was written about 10 years ago, but resurfaced um, in, uh, in uh, early COVID. Um, I'm not sure what stage COVID we're in now, but it was a few COVIDs ago when the article sort of popped back up in feeds again. It's a great read. It's written by the authors of the book called Willpower, and we will put that link in the chat. Um, so the study here that's really convincing is a study that was done um, in the Israeli court system that studied um, parole. And um, when uh, it was in the parole board, when people came in front of a judge to request parole, when they did that in the morning, about 70% of the people who requested parole got it. In the afternoon, which is the same judges, and the same composition of petitioners, fewer than 10% receive parole. Wow. So it's not the kind of people, it's not the kind of requests. It, it, it's not the judge, those were all the same. Um, and so the hypothesis there, or, or the finding there is that as the as you go on, as you reach decision fatigue, you are less able to balance evidence and to consider a wide range of choices, and um, and to and to sort of and to be consistent in your decision making. So we change in our decisions. The decisions that we make, we would not necessarily make the decision at nine a.m that we would at 4 p.m. And knowing that is really key to understanding what kind of a decision you wanna make at what time of day. The, the truth is, is that schools are not ERs. There are some decisions we have to make right away, no question. Right. But a lot of them can wait overnight. And so if you've got a big decision on your table and you know that the only time that you have to, you know, the, the, the time you have to weigh the evidence is late in the day, weigh the evidence then, but try to hold off on making the decision to the morning. Gather the, you can, it's okay to separate gathering yeah. the evidence and making the decision. Um, and it's okay to say to people, I am going to make the best decision tomorrow morning and you'll have this decision by 10. It's okay to do that because you're gonna feel better about the decision that you make and so will everybody else because you're gonna be able to see all the choices in a much more clear and balanced way. You know, this is one of those things too where it's it comes out in aphorisms and conventional wisdom, right? Sleep on it is something that we've heard before but now to find out that there's actual science behind that, right? It's, the old wives knew what they were talking about when they said you need to sleep on it. Exactly. Um, so that's, that's the second thing to take into account. And the third is that our identities are deeply tied to our capacity 
for decision making. And that's because systemic racism, poverty, sexism, homophobia, ableism, all these systemic injustices that are full that fill our days impact the number of decisions you have to make. If you are a person mm -hmm. with privilege, you make many fewer decisions than a person without privilege. So the classic um, example here is grocery shopping. And there are a weird number of studies about shopping um, in general and grocery shopping in particular. Um, and part of what you have to think about is that if you are a uh, financially stable, middle class, wealthy person, when you go into the supermarket, you have a list. If it's on the list, you put it in your basket and you check out, right? The decision is, do I want the large size or the small size? Do I want this, like this brand or that brand? Mm -hmm. When you are a person who is living in poverty, every decision that you make about what goes into that basket is a trade-off. Do I put this in my basket or do I put that in my basket? Because I can't have both. Or do I put these things in my basket and not pay this bill? Or do I pick up another shift? You walk out of that grocery store having made dozens more decisions and dozens more highly consequential decisions. Yeah, I was gonna say decisions with consequence and decisions with impact on others, not just yourself, but in your family, you mm -hmm. may hear, well, why don't we have, or what's it? Well, and then you've got to explain the decision and that's only got to compound the fatigue. Right. Um, or, or take the example of the classroom. Take the example of a student of color who is constantly code switching in the predominantly white institution of the independent school. That student, from the moment that they, that they began their journey to school, has been preparing for this process, has been rehearsing it, um, has been making decisions along the way so that when they show up in a predominantly white institution, they're, they're showing up differently. And that's a series of decisions. So when that student of color and a white student sit down to take a test, they have very different, they, they have very different levels of cognitive exhaustion at that point. Or, yeah, or think about students for whom English is not their first language. The yeah. amount of cognitive load that they're carrying going into just, just the rest of the day, right? So there's mental translating and all of that is using up cognitive skills. And I think about what you've said in the past about designing systems so that we can really focus students' cognitive skills on on where we want them to be. And so the disproportionate impact of, uh, of not having, gosh, I'm gonna beat this horse to death again, but the unified LMS, right? So is it disproportionately hitting some students and considering that uh, along the way that matters? Yeah. So the point of this is that your, that your, your identity and your life as a whole is inextricably linked to whatever task you are doing that purports to be separate from the rest of your identity. It is not. We have one brain. One brain is doing it all. And so if you've got somebody who, um, let's say, let's step away from the, from the systemic issues and talk about the personal one. Let's say that you've got an employee who is also a full-time caretaker um, to a um, to an aging parent. You know, in the past, he would have said, "Hey, you know, just when you're at work, I need you to be at work, right?" And anybody who's been in the situation where they've got something outside of the dimensions of the task that they're supposed to be doing knows that's not how it works. It's not how our emotions work, but actually it's also not how our brains work. The inability to compartmentalize 
the inability to not be affected by the very real forces that our institutions purport to be free of, and we all know never are, you know, those, those are constantly having an effect on us. And so knowing who the people you work with are, taking that into account is part of understanding what people need in order to be, to, to be replenished and in order to succeed. Super important. And I think that's a, a real takeaway for academic leaders of making sure that they understand what the capacity is and then think about when to time things. Yeah. Telling someone who you know is going through something that's really depleting their decision-making capacity, hey, I want to talk to you about this in the morning. Here's, here's what's coming. Right. So some do the research. You can still do the research when you're in that cognitive overload, but I'm not going to ask you for a decision until tomorrow. Yeah. So are there some other strategies that you think academic leaders can use? Um, so thinking um, about this? One of the things that I talked about um, in my blog post is reducing the options. Um, that you can do that for yourself by just saying, you know what, these are the sources I go to. Sometimes you can do it in saying, um, you know what, I'm going to ask these three people. Um, I, I have worked, um, I can remember being a dean of students and talking to a family about um, a schedule issue. And the family kept saying, well, but what about this? What about, and finally, I just said, I have given you all the options that exist. <laughs> there, you know, it have, I, I think I did it more compassionately than that, um, but I might've been at decision fatigue. Um, but just to say, you know what? These are the choices you have to make from, we don't have any other options for you. Like actually sometimes saying that is relieving people of a burden. Um, and, and asking people not to decide from the full range of what exists in the world. Um, so um, when I was an English teacher, the difference in saying, so what books should we teach the ninth graders to saying, okay, today we're gonna look at uh, contemporary novels. And that's, that, that's, what, that's the slot we're looking for here, right? Narrow, okay. narrow it down because the more choices you have, the more overload you get to. Um, sometimes this is called the Trader Joe's effect because when you go into Trader Joe's, they only have, um, unless it's like chocolates, like they only have one of everything, right? There is right. one kind of, of, of vinegar that they have and one brand of flour and one brand of applesauce. You have fewer choices as opposed to walking in and looking at what can be a literal aisle of tomato sauce options, right? So um, people actually make choices faster and are happier about the choices they make when they have fewer options. You know, we talked about this a little while ago and our colleague Peter Gow would also say this, which is that if you have a frame or a guiding star, so like using your mission, for example, is one of these options more mission aligned? Yes, okay, then let's make a really good argument for not just going there or that's decision made. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so I think finding those North Stars. Yeah, and articulating that priority. Don't just let it be implicit, make it explicit. The decision that we make is about doing what, what is best for our students. You know, that is, that is the question we have to ask. Is this option better or is that option better? And then usually exactly. when you're all on the same page about the priority, the decisions come faster and everybody, and everybody gets on the same page pretty quickly too. And then you can really wrestle with the ones that are true ethical dilemmas where it's competing rights or goods. And then, you know, save your cognitive energy for that. Exactly. You know what? Not every decision is equal. Um, so for example, um, you know, President Obama famously said, I only wear a blue suit or a gray suit because I have a lot of really important decisions to make. And I don't wanna use up my decisions on the small ones. It's why you see so many people talking about routines and habits because once something becomes a routine or a habit, it doesn't 
fill up your, doesn't co uh, contribute to your decision capacity. Um, know what's important, spend the time on what's important. And when it's not important, feel comfortable sometimes with just, you know, not even making it a decision, just make it a routine. That's okay. Um, you have lots and lots of important questions to answer and, um, and you wanna be able to put your energy where it matters most. Great advice. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Liz, for doing this compelling research. And as you go out there to make decisions, um, give yourself a break, have a snack, and it's okay to sleep on it. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>